Hey guys, Drifter here. Today's episode of In-Depth is going to be abnormally in-depth. We are going to be taking a very deep dive into that sketchy Activision patent that many people in the community claims is actively nerfing you as you play Call of Duty. For those of you that are unaware, there was an Activision patent in 2017 and I believe a follow-up in 2019 and 2020 where they patented a variety of matchmaking systems to match people based on skill level, team cooperation, friendliness, social rankings, and they had the ability to dynamically adjust the difficulty of the game in order to make the group dynamics better if there's mixed skill levels. Many people in the community believe that this is evidence that it's not skill-based matchmaking or lag causing you to miss your shots or struggle in Black Ops Cold War, but rather that Activision is literally nerfing you mid-game because you are too good of a player and it's adjusting it to get some sort of balance or desired result from the lobby. The structure of the video is going to be very simple. In the first half, I'm basically going to go through the entire patent, explain what all it's saying, what all it's claiming it can do. And then in the second half, I'm roughly going to debunk it or fact check it as if it were a conspiracy video, because largely it is. The TLDR is that the patent is for Skylanders, and that's very easy to prove, but it is an Activision Blizzard patent, so it's very spooky. So if you look this up on YouTube, what you'll see are a lot of videos from people in our community talking about this patent, and they're not particularly positive. Even super shills like Exclusive Ace, Prestigious Key, uh, I've made videos on it in the past. You'll see it kind of Activision patent is manipulating your matches, the patent, uh, Activision patent's a big problem, Activision exposed. This guy's really popular, why so serious? I think his video got the most views for it this year. He kind of restarted this thing and put it out into the public. Of course, also with an onus on the viewer to act and to, man to demand change. And as you move down, you'll just see more of the same kind of all the way down. So this spread very far and very fast through the community. And I think it spread that far because Call of Duty is a weird wonky game and a lot of weird and unpredictable things happen. And people match that experience up with a relative relatively credible claim that they're being nerfed mid-game and they say, aha, we figured it out. So here's the patent itself. You can look this up. This is uh, uspatentoffice.gov. It's public. Anybody can view it. And there are a couple of similar patents as well. You'll find one regarding microtransactions, and I think you'll find one regarding lobby experience and a couple of very, very similar things. And they all say very similar things. But since this is the most popular one, we're going to stick with it. And as we can scroll through, you can see it's a patent application. Uh, methods and, systema and systems for incentivizing team cooperation in multiple player gaming environments. You can see the inventors that we'll all be looking up later. Name City, Activision Publishing, Santa Monica, California, Family ID, when it was filed, 2017. I suppose this is when it was granted, perhaps. And you can even see all these different classifications and a lot of stuff. And it starts off with the claims. And I cannot read this entire massive document to you. And even quite a lot of it is kind of very... Uh, word soup here. It's like implemented Im implemented in a computer having a processor and random access memory wherein the processor is in data communication with the display. It's basically saying like that's a screen. It says stuff like that forever. So I've got some notes on the side to break this down and just jump to the juicy parts, the parts about you being nerfed mid, you know, match. Uh, we have numbers 1 through 23. There's a lot of stuff going on here about degree of cooperation extended by one player to at least another, uh, degree of items given by one player to at least another uh, player on the team. Uh, we have this computer readable memory thing again, determining the degree of items given. And what this is for 1 through 21 is sort of a tracking of team cooperation. It's kind of defining variables for how much you cooperate with your team, how much you help them, what they're doing. And they have to be very specific about it for this patent to work, which we'll talk about later why they have to be so specific. It's actually quite a boring section. Now, in this uh, field section here, there's something very interesting. It says, uh, present specification is related to improving player matching, generating content derived from or based on social networks. Interesting that they can do that. Customizing content to a player's skill level and incentivizing cooperative team behavior within an online environment. Most of you are going to jump on the skill level thing because that looks a lot like skill-based matchmaking, which is something that we're all pretty much opposed to in the Call of Duty community. Uh, we have some background sections. I'm really glad these are all labeled. They help me skip through really quickly to show you what I want. Uh, but we're going to go through a lot of this. This is kind of background on what a game is and how it works. And here's a fun one. 
most processes attempt to match based on complementary gaming skills. Examples include the game profile, player profile, prior match scores, like skill-based matchmaking, and prior quality scores. Some systems may automatically group or match players based solely on a limited number of hard-coded characteristics like skill level, which are done not dynamically adjusted. Uh, such systems may create a rigidly segregated pools of players. Man, this is just like skill-based matchmaking to a T right here. There's even a section at the bottom about subjective variables, such as a degree of likability or a fun factor between the players, which is kind of kind of crazy. I mean, it, there's a lot going on here, and if you if you just read this offhand, it would seem like this in itself is a skill-based matchmaking patent. Number seven is more of the same kind of stuff, talking about how it tracks and rates groups and matches. And then near the very end, there's a little section here, and it says, and dynamically modify the gaming parameters for that player or group of players within the tracked social group based on a, a variety of things within the social network, which again sounds like they're playing with the dynamics of the game in real time and kind of screwing people up. In the summary section, numbers 8 all the way down here to 18 are again effectively defining various forms of cooperation. Where is a good example of that uh, da, 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 extended by at least one other player to help the other player solve a problem? Bum, 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 bum. Cooperation extended by at least one player to at least one other player to defeat an enemy in the game or to help overcome an obstacle in the game. There's a lot of this kind of all the way down. It's very verbose and legalese. And then we're going to get to a description of drawings. Description of drawings is a totally different thing. This is only a portion, the text only portion of the patent. The rest of the patent has a variety of drawings and stuff that we will absolutely be going through today in order as they are needed. So we're not going to focus on the text describing the drawings of these too much because we're going to be going over them in depth in just a moment. In the section called Detailed Description, it's a lot more the same, except they also try to define the scope of the patent, so you can see how broad and general and unspecific it is, and it helps them kind of get the patent. So in 0037 right here, you will find the general principles defined herein may be implied to other embodiments and applications without departing from the spirit and scope of the invention. Also, the terminology and phraseology is for the purpose of describing exemplary embodiments and should not be considered limiting. Thus, the present invention is to be accorded in the widest scope in pos encompassing numerous activities, modifications, and equivalents with consistent principles and features disclosed. Uh, basically, what they're saying is that this is not a specific patent. They are not patenting an exact algorithm. They're not giving up their numbers. They're more than anything, perhaps, patenting a principle or a process. It's a very wide sweeping pattern. And if you read like patent law, you'll see a whole lot of this stuff. It's not a specific thing. Section 42 is very interesting to me. It says, while the aspects of the present specification may be described herein without reference, game levels, blah, 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 roles, items associated with a first person shooter game. Very interesting, very not Skylanders, I will uh, point out, though they do use Overwatch as an example later. A first person shooter game, it should be appreciated that any such examples are for illustrative purposes only. So the Overwatch examples are, again, for illustrative purposes only, but are also not considered limiting. Again, very, very broad, broad patent idea that we have going on here. That should kind of let you know the scope of what's being worked on and the lack of specificity in, within. There's a neat section at double lot 46. The term modifying parameters of a game session may be construed to mean a technical process of using a processor to change the data entries of a gaming console or gaming server in the process of program programmatically generating one or more levels of a gameplay session. So if you're playing a roguelike game or a game that kind of randomly spawns enemies or has some sort of uh, randomization or generation process to it, that's kind of what it's explaining. A lot of people will take the modifying parameters to mean your damage or bullets or whatever, but this appears to be, especially this programmatically generating, that's really like a roguelike game, kind of like Hades. As you scroll through here, you will see a lot more of the same kind of stuff, implicit likability, level of cooperation, celebratory actions are defined, positive and neg negative chatting are studied, they'll say this processor stuff over and over and over again until we get down here to 07. Now, this one is a little bit more interesting. 074 refers to a specific figure, which we can look at. 
Uh, it says a host may facilitate a multiplayer game by dynamically modifying the gaming environment or parameters to suit the skill levels of one or more players in the gaming session, measuring the team's performance in that session, likability factors, social groups, and blah, blah, blah. But again, the important part is modifying the game parameters. It does say a host, so I assume that's somebody hosting a private match, but it could be a server host anywhere else, and that is figures 2A and 2C which I can open up over here. These are like very, very boring ones. Don't worry about those. But you can see here's the host. These kind of look like peer-to-peer -peer networks. They're not the most intricate figures that you've ever seen. One that you're all probably very interested in is content customization based on player skill level. Uh-oh, sounds like more like skill-based matchmaking to me. There's a lot going on here. A uh, gaming environment identifies a skill level of each player and subsequently modifies one or more parameters of the game for each player amongst multiple players. Skill level can be based on a variety of factors, including experience, achievement, in-game statistics, such as kill-death ratio, win-loss rate, and da -da 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 -da. the gaming environment automatically detects the player's skill level based on mesh, uh, session behavior, uh, da, 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 da. weapon accuracy is a thing, favorite weapon usage, number of games left, stuff like that. And it can then, you know, modify the game based on that skill level. Let's keep on moving. There's a whole bunch of these to go through today. Number 77 is more of the same, talking about uh, modifying the environment to match the specific skill level of a player. And after this, we have a big section describing, describing these drawings and what they do. It's, it's pretty much everything from here to the bottom is describing an image and instead of reading you all of this what i would rather do is kind of show you the images and go through it and uh, we do have one at 099 that we're going to come back to in just a second a pretty big one but let's open up those images that i talked about before so these images were filed with the patent and you can see little uh what i would call these like iterative flows or like block programming acquire the skill level modify one or more game parameters, and I assume that happens before the game begins, and present data to each player via the game console. You can see another table that helps identify skill levels such as degree of accuracy, likelihood of being targeted by an enemy, a high skill level person is going to get targeted more, low skill level less, bonus chance of finding pow more powerful treasure is higher at a low skill level, different multipliers, uh, friendly fire damage amount to teammates, you give none to low skill people, in the very next figure here, you can see even more modifications based on skill level, or, or actually it's a more of an explanation of what you lack at a lower skill level. At a lower skill level, you don't have as many guns. Uh, enemies might miss the player more often, whereas a really high skill person, they'll nail every time. You, this is a super interesting one. Player, If you're a high skill player, player attacks need to be precise to hit the enemy. Low skill players attacks have a generous leeway and do not need great precision to hit the enemy uh, bonus loot of treasure frequency of hints given customization options is pretty standard stuff this one is is more the same as well acquire skill level aggregate skill level of all players modify a parameter load in the game figure 4a refers to a, a whole ton of things in the patent about your sort of social score uh, cooperation metric, how good or bad of a player you are, how you like to work, how you interact with other teams. It's almost like a social-based matchmaking they're trying to represent here. And you can even see a table of some of the examples and cooperation metrics and how they would do this. Did you heal people? Did you share a weapon? Did you do a coordinated combo attack? Did you compliment or praise others? You can get various metrics of score out of that. And the example that they used here was Overwatch, which is a first-person shooter developed by Activision. It even gave an example of the overall team level of skill, cooperation, whatever rating they wanted. But interestingly, as we saw earlier, it said that it is not just limited to an FPS or any example given, but a very broad sweeping thing. So it could be anywhere, anytime. Here's a pretty fun one. Track implicit likability metrics between a player. Then we determine an overall likability measure. Prompt the player to provide feedback. Generate positive or negative likability metric respectively. And this is more like social based matchmaking. And they even have ways you can kind of like lose it. Like check this out, quitting a gameplay session before finishing, positive chatting. I guess if you're VOIP or texting and then it's all going to be recorded, they can hear it. Engaging in celebratory behavior. Man, this is the most evil patent I have ever seen. Now this one is different. This one, uh, identify a social group and you have all this stuff. This is all like a uh, feedback on their skill levels and their 
uh, what they like to play, how they play, what they've played the most, their social scores, and that goes into customizing content for the group, which then provides a customized experience for that group. And you see more of the same kind of thing here, user feedback, users are playing at the same skill level repeatedly. Well, we're gonna incentivize this by adding special rewards on, upon completion and a variety of different kind of things to keep people uh, playing and engaged in the game. And then at that point, we're back to the regular patent. This is identical to the one that I had on the screen just a moment ago, except I had to kind of rotate it to see these images. But I wanted you to see all of the images in the patent as well, because they look quite bad, to be honest. Honestly, at this point in the video, many of you are probably believers. It's in your heart. It's good to go. It's ready. It's done. It's a real deal. I'm being nerfed real time. Uh, but we're about to hit the second half. We have one more thing to read. Let's see. And a third, imp this is improved player matching. In a third implementation of the present specification, uh, da, 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 uh, da, da, provided to match players based on the basis of common interests that encourage entertainment and therefore an ability of players to be to like the gaming environment. Basically, what this talks about is trying to make matches that make players enjoy the game more for a variety of reasons. They want people to be happy with the matchmaking system. And it says that this matching can be performed of other factors such as latency, relative skill levels, or uh, a presence of players such as friends or teammates, team composition, that, that they can ignore those factors in order to just match people in a game that they think that they will enjoy. So after reading through this patent, after reading through all of this, many of you are now what I would call patent believers. It's the word I'm gonna use since apparently I am a patent denier. Many of you are probably thinking that perhaps you have experienced these things, perhaps you have felt these things, or that you were playing Call of Duty and your bullets didn't register and you wonder if maybe I'm a little bit too good. And maybe, just maybe, Activision decided to nerf me and give me a lesser accuracy or make me have to be more precise to hit than my enemies in a variety of things. And I think that's kind of how a lot of these YouTube videos are designed, that you experience something weird in Call of Duty and then they hit you with this patent that almost perfectly describes the weirdness you're experiencing and saying, aha, proof evidence done. But now we're gonna move on to the debunking part, which is my personal favorite part. And we're gonna start off with who actually filed this patent? Well, we do know that it was Activision Publishing in Santa Monica, California. But what's super interesting to me is it shows you the inventors of the patents right here. All of these people I'm highlighting are various people that live in and around California and were involved in creating this monster of a patent. This is their baby. So perhaps it's important to see who these people are. So I did a little bit of Googling, a little bit of searching, and you're gonna see the same story over and over and over again, that this is very clearly for Skylanders the moment we jump into researching these people. So we have Paul Reich, Reich the third. If you look for him, you'll find him right here on Wikipedia, game designer, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, Star Control Universe. And if you scroll down, uh, after several successful releases, Reach left Freefall to form Toys for Bob with this person named Fred Ford. Now, Toys for Bob would go on to make very popular games, such as da -da -da -da, under Activision, Skylanders, Skylanders Giants, Skylanders uh, Spyro's Adventure, Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam. That's kind of the team that he's working on under Activision. And you wonder what this company like Toys for Bob is. What in the world is Toys for Bob? Well, if you search for Toys for Bob, you'll see that it's a video game developer. They mostly do Star Control and Skylanders. Again, for those of you that don't know, Skylanders is an Activision-based kids game. If I remember correctly, you collect the little figurines and, and you battle them. I didn't really play a a lot of Skylanders. I don't really know that much about it. I just know that it's a kid's game and it's largely PVE for the most part. So Toys for Bob is a game developer and they've developed a lot of stuff, but they got bought out by Activision in, a, a, was it 2002? God, forever ago. But they've been working on Spylander, Tony Hawk, uh, Spylander, Spyro, Skylander, Tony Hawk, and a lot of stuff like that. Even Crash Bandicoot was developed by them. So the systems that they're working on are primarily for the or that this person works on is the kids games for Activision. So yeah, here's Toys for Bob's website. You can see we've made blah, blah, blah for years. They talk about Skylanders a lot. They talk about these same people a lot. So I've clearly found the right group of people. The next person that we can look up on from the patent is this Robert Ford. He seems to go by Fred Ford more than anybody else because uh, you'll find, we, we'd, where was he at? He was here in this 
Paul Reich guy. Yeah, Fred Ford. The next person is Adrian M. Letta, who you can find uh, via Google. I'm not going to show you some of this stuff. Some of this stuff is a little bit personal, but you can find Adrian's about page where he talks about being a senior designer on Skylanders. Interesting that we're not mentioning Call of Duty for any of this stuff. He did a, a whole ton of stuff for Skylanders, a whole ton of design. The next person you can look up on the patent is Paul D. Yan. Now, Paul D. Yan is more interesting. He has a public Twitter account that you can follow. Uh, C CEO for Toys for Bob. Again, they have a lot of followers because they're building Crash Bandicoot stuff right now, primarily. Then we've got uh, his patents. Paul D. Paul D. Yan has a metric ton of patents for all sorts of stuff. Character animation, content generation, and multiplayer. Uh, methods to modify a two-dimensional facial image and increase dimensional depth. That's turning it like a picture into a 3D scan. Reality-based video game elements, ARG things. He's working on a lot of stuff for Activision. Move back to the next person. Neil J. Uh, Daniel J. Neil, I was able to find. Uh, he's here on Wikipedia. Not, not Wikipedia. I am, you can tell I'm tired. IMDB of all places. Best known for his work on Skylanders Giants, Skylanders Superchargers. It's all Skylanders all the way down. You can even see an interview with this person, the devil that created your uh, boogeyman matchmaking patent. And here he is very clearly working at home, making stuff for Skylanders again and not Call of Duty. So let's look at the next person. Maybe this person will be a COD developer, Michael D. Ebert. If we look up Michael D. Ebert, you'll find him again, Toys for Bob, LucasArts, Activision, which is Skylanders. Again, let's try again. Uh, Avery Lodato. Avery Lodato was pretty easy to find. I don't want to show too much of his information. Some of this is a little bit personal, but Studio Head, Toys for Bob, again, Skylanders, again. So if this patent is active in Call of Duty, that would be very unusual because every single person that developed it developed it for Skylanders. Apparently, every single person is part of the Skylanders team. And as you read through, the majority of it talks about creating a social experience for players, which in this case is probably children. It talks about modifying the difficulty of enemies, like the PvE enemies, modifying the rewards that you get out of the game, like the chest and gold and PvE rewards in Skylanders, and just tons and tons of stuff that very clearly applies more to Skylanders than Call of Duty or Overwatch or just anything like that. Another interesting thing to point out is that you can patent an invention that doesn't exist. You can patent things that you have not manufactured, created, prototyped, and don't ever even plan to. You can patent a thing just to sit on it and kill it. If you want to Google this, there's a lot of different articles about it. Um, but th you don't. the thing that you patent does not have to exist to be patentable. Even in this case, scientists are citing patents for things that don't exist. You can do that too. They're kind of often known as poor man's patents, utility patents, broad sweeping patents. And even in, in the somewhere in all of this, we went over pretty early on, the scope of this patent is extremely big and extremely broad. So it's kind of one of these like patenting things that they wanted to work on or considered working on in the future, but it isn't guaranteed proof that they exist. And a good example of that would be funny patents. You can, there's like a, literally a bajillion of these. This is the first website I've seen. A cure for impotence that contains odors and uh, possible fragrances like pumpkin pie and donut. You, there is a head exerciser patent where people pull things between their teeth. The urinal headrest patent. I've never seen one of these existing before. Uh, rodent blaster is, is a real patent. Calculate your life expectancy watch. Somebody probably did make that alarming wake-up call with all these bells over your face. The, the wearable pet display so your hamster can crawl all around your body in very creepy, weird kind of ways. None of this stuff actually exists. People don't use these things. Maybe they, maybe maybe Floridians use the beer umbrella, but actually, probably a lot of people do here in Texas as well. But the point of it is, 
that a patent existing is not proof that the technology exists. And this is 10. This is 10 out of a million. You can go to the library and buy whole books of these things. As a kid, I used to read these things for ages because it was just so funny and so silly. It's like historical humor. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of ridiculous things like this that were granted real patents and were never, ever, ever actually manufactured or put into practice. Now that we're done with the patent review, we can get to the opinion section on this video where I can talk about it a little bit. In my opinion, it is very clearly a patent designed many years ago to apply to Skylanders. They wanted to find a way for kids of mixed skill levels to play together and still have fun and to reward people of various skill levels and keep their game engaging for children primarily. It is a broad patent. It is a sweeping one and there's no reason that you couldn't implement a similar system in Call of Duty. The problem with it is that none of the people involved had anything to do with Call of Duty. The patent mostly focused on PvE, and if it was applied in Call of Duty, we don't have any evidence of it in the game. So when it comes to, when you ask a patent believer, God, I hate saying that word, what's the evidence? What is, what is the evidence for this? And they will primarily say two things. Number one, the patent itself. The patent itself is the evidence of existence, but as we've talked about, patents don't really prove the thing exists or is real, that's kind of like, well, what's the proof the Bible's real? The Bible says so. It's kind of recursive there, so we're not going to get into that. And then the second one is, well, I can feel it. You can feel it. We can feel it. I, I experienced this. My bullets didn't hit. My game lagged. I feel like I'm dealing less damage than my enemies. My experience is the evidence that such a thing exists, and that's not something that I'm willing to go along with. I for probably four or five years went against the grain of the community in a career suicide move saying that skill-based matchmaking does not exist and utterly slamming people into the ground telling me that their experience is proof because it is not. Your experience for anything is not scientific data. On a good day, it's qualitative data. On a good day, it's something interesting to look at. Your experience does not explain 10,000 lines of code and an extraordinarily complex algorithm being deployed in a live environment and engineered in a way where you couldn't, or at least you're not supposed to notice it. Your experience isn't better than that code or actual peer-reviewed scientific research. And in my life, I change my opinions primarily only when there's new data or new research to back that up. I try not to change my opinions based on other people's experiences. I'm very cautious about changing my opinions based on my own experiences because I'm still a people too. I have biases, I have psychological weaknesses, and I can be wrong. So I'm a, I'm a big data man and I will argue people until I am blue in the face and dead and dying in the ground that it is foolish and illogical to change opinions based on your feelings or your individual subjective experiences. A brief example of this, I couldn't tell you how many people this year have told me that coronavirus isn't that bad, that they got coronavirus pretty early on, it was annoying, it was like the flu, they recovered, no big deal. Everybody should be able to do this. Since I got it and it wasn't bad for me, it's not bad for anybody else. What they got was a different experience and a different sample than anybody else and inappropriately applied it to all cases of coronavirus, which I don't think would be a fair thing to do. There is the possibility that I'm wrong about this. And for example, I was wrong about the existence of skill-based matchmaking. And once there was good scientific data proving that such a thing existed, I changed my opinion on it. I think that's a reasonable thing to do when you're presented with new and good data to perhaps update your belief system. And if you, the community, want to convert me into a patent believer, then my challenge to you is to do a study, do a test, do a real big boy scientific test. When it came to skill matching, I challenged people to do this for years, and what they would primarily do is send me a gameplay of a really hard lobby and say, this is every day, there's my evidence, or here's the difference between a, a noob account and a pro account, and the, you know, the experience is different, therefore that explains everything that I want to believe about a complicated algorithm, and that's just not how science works. If you guys want to blow this patent out of the water, if you want to expose me, expose Activision, do a lot of things like that, you're going to need to sit down and put forth the time and effort to do a real scientific study, to collect data, to get uh, design parameters, control variables, experimental variables, to analyze footage, to really genuinely learn things, and then present your findings to the community in a way where all the data is public so that we can peer review it and play with the data ourselves, exactly like how Ace and Jay God and myself decided to do with the skill-based matchmaking. 
making test. That's really how you prove something exists. That's really how you get the ball rolling on changes. Making conspiracy videos and just getting mad at people and calling them shills and demanding changes does absolutely nothing. Which brings me to the last little bit of the opinion section. There is a psychographic overlap between, let's say, patent believers and COD conspiracy, conspiracy people and conspiracy people in general, I would all, I would, I would really call them like the snowflake, the outrage group, the people that are sort of, they have to have an external enemy for whatever reason to appease their psyches. But they, they fundamentally believe these things almost on an emotional level. It's, it's as real as gravity to them. A lot of people see something like this and it becomes permanent in their brain, permanent to the point where even a real scientific test or study wouldn't mean anything because first impressions are the most important thing to them in the world. And then they engage with you on a level of extremity, urgency. They engage with you that this is criminal behavior, that this is the utmost urgency, not only for Call of Duty, but the entire world, that if you aren't willing to sacrifice your entire career for this, then you are a bad person. The type of people that engage with me and push this super hard would probably like to see me commit ritual suicide outside of Activision headquarters in protest, but wouldn't do so themselves. It's a sort of thing of, since this is important to me, it has to be more important to you kind of group without ever explaining why I need to care and why you know the, the burden falls upon me to do various things for this belief system. You see the exact same thing across the, uh, we'll say primarily political conspiracy spectrum now about um, uh, QAnon type stuff and adrenochrome and election, jillions of election conspiracies, flat earth kind of overlaps in this demographic. And the problem that you run into engaging with these people in an earnest and genuine way is that they don't really want that. Uh, they want an excuse to justify their anger and behavior. And when you engage with these people in a genuine way, uh, a couple of things can happen. Number one, they can just be really nasty and reject you and be rude and hateful. I've had that happen more times than not. Usually when people are really mean to me, I just kind of swallow it and reach out and try to be as kind and forgiving as possible. And with this particular mindset of people, usually they hate that more than anything and get twice as ugly. The other two problems you run into are sort of like philosophical ones almost, or uh, logical fallacy ones. It's There was a quote, I oh got it was like a, a Jewish guy that survived World War II and said that a dishonest debater is one of the most difficult people to deal with. Or maybe we'll use flat earth since that's a little bit less political. Flat earth is a very simple one. They have a lot of bizarre claims. And they don't have to be particular with your language, be, with their language, because what they say and their community and their people that support them isn't necessarily tied to what they're actually saying. It's not tied to their claims, to their facts, to their belief system. They're, they have the flexibility of changing their mind and opinion, and the whole group change, changes with them almost instantly. You, as an honest intellectual debater, a real person that wants to engage with this, they will scrutinize you under a microscope laser beam. Anytime you misspeak, anytime you make a mistake, anytime you are very slightly technically wrong, it just gets hammered over and over and over again to pry a giant weakness into you to make you look less credible. Whereas they'll just say anything, anytime, and it doesn't matter because there was no credibility to begin with. Uh, a lot of sort of negative people on the internet use this to their example. And the other issue is sort of the... Uh, what would I call it? I would call it the treadmill of endless arguments. And Flat Earth is a perfect one for this one. They present an argu argument and you engage with them, perhaps laboriously on your part, because science is difficult, science is boring, science takes a long time. And you work really earnestly with this person to kind of help dispel a silly belief about Flat Earth, but they didn't really want that to begin with. So then they'll come back two days later with a whole new argument and you'll do it again. And then they'll come back a few days later with a whole new argument and you'll do it again. And the amount of effort that you have to put out to dispel this kind of nonsense and disinformation is perhaps 10 times the amount of effort that it takes to create it. I think that there's about a 10 to 1 BS factor in the world that anytime somebody creates some BS, it takes about 10 times more effort to get rid of it because BS spreads very, very quickly. Because of that, if you get into the habit of taking this particular mindset of people very seriously all the time, always 
acquiescing to their debates, to not hiding from their claims, to debunking and doing things like this. What you eventually do is completely exhaust yourself. You wear down yourself mentally, emotionally, to where you're no longer able or willing to engage. And then when you're burnt out and done, they're still going to crank out whatever nonsense they wanted to. It's a very difficult thing to defeat. And I perhaps foolishly, uh, self-punishingly try all the time on this channel to be a bastion of knowledge and education and logical reasoning. So I sometimes have to butt my head against these types of people in the community or, or just at large. It's, it's a mindset that I don't particularly like, but it's exhausting and difficult. And uh, that's just kind of how I feel about it. Guys, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of In-Depth. My God, it's been a crazy one. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.